BP has announced its latest attempt to seal the largest oil spill in U.S. history once and for all appears to be working. Dubbed static kill, the operation forces a heavy synthetic fluid called drilling mud down into the well. BP said today pressure in the well appears to be stabilizing. A 75-ton cap placed on the well last month has contained the oil, but it's considered a temporary measure. According to government estimates, nearly 5 million barrels of oil gushed into the Gulf of Mexico from BP's oil well before it was capped July 15. Scientists estimate as many as 62,000 barrels of oil were leaking from the well each day at its peak. That's that's more than 12 times as much oil as the government originally projected. Retired Coast Guard Admiral Thad Allen, who's coordinating the Obama administration's response to the oil spill disaster, said static hill alone is not enough to plug the well. The relief wells are the answer. Uh, there's, there's a limit to how much we know and can find out from the, uh, the static kill, if you will. First of all, uh, if the uh, annulus uh, cannot be accessed from the top, in other words, we didn't compromise the seals, then we'll only be able to fill uh, the, the drill pipe itself, uh, the, the casing with, with uh, mud, and then we'd have to actually go into the bottom anyway. We need to go into the bottom to make sure we fill the annulus, uh, the casing, and any drill pipe there, and then follow that with cement. This thing won't truly be sealed until those relief wells are done. Well, ever since BP placed a temporary cap on the well last month, the media has been abuzz with reports of how the oils largely disappeared from the surface of the Gulf of Mexico. And The New York Times is reporting today the government's expected to announce today that three-quarters of the oil has already evaporated, dispersed, been captured or otherwise eliminated, and that much of the rest is so diluted it doesn't seem to pose much additional risk of harm. It's not clear what effect the more than 1.8 million gallons of the dispersant corexit that was dumped in the Gulf will have. But independent journalists, scientists, activists and fisher folk who have been to the Gulf recently tell a different story. I'm joined now by two guests. From Washington, D.C., Antonia Juhas is with us, director of the Chevron program at Global Exchange and author of The Tyranny of Oil, the world's most powerful industry and what we must do to stop it. She's just back from Louisiana, where she found some of BP's missing oil on the wetlands and beaches along the waterways near St. Mary's Parish, where no one's booming, cleaning, skimming or watching. And joining us from New Orleans is environmentalist Jerry Cope. He spent the last few weeks traveling along the Gulf Coast and experiencing firsthand the contamination in the air and water. He just published a piece in the Huffington Post where Cope argues that instead of celebrating the allegedly vanishing oil, we should be concerned about the disappearance of marine life in the Gulf. He describes the Gulf as a kill zone and looks into where the marine animals have gone, given that BP has reported a relatively no, low number of dead animals from the spill. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Jerry Cope, let's begin with you in New Orleans. Um, talk about what you found. Well, a um, friend of mine, Charles Hamilton, and I came down about three weeks ago. We've been hearing a lot of stories. People were calling both of us uh, regarding the, the loss of marine life and that there was a tremendous cover-up operation in place to conceal this from the, the public and the media. And this was at the same time where uh, a lot of you know, mainstream media were complaining about restricted access, that they couldn't get onto the beaches, they weren't allowed to fly. So these calls kept coming in. We finally decided three weeks ago to come down and, and see for ourselves what the situation was. And we went from Louisiana all the way to Florida, spent a great deal of time around Orange Beach and Gulf Shores, Alabama, which it tends to it's kind of like ground zero in this whole mess in terms of especially the effects of the dispersant. There's a great many people there that are sick and ill. The doctors aren't really sure how to treat them. Uh, Dr. Ricky Ott's been down spending a lot of time with those folks. Uh, myself, I have uh, pneumonia induced by chemical exposure. I've been talking to doctors in Boston. But the, uh, we talked to numerous fishermen and local people, and there was, in fact, a very large-scale operation with BP, assisted by several federal, federal agencies, to cover up the loss of marine life. They uh, gathered up the fish, birds, whales, dolphins, all the sea life, and uh, the carcasses were destroyed in very large numbers. Uh, Jerry Cope, you mentioned Ricky Ott. You interviewed the marine toxicologist. She's an Exxon Valdez survivor last week about the disappearance of marine life in the Gulf. This is a clip from that interview. We also know from Exxon Valdez that only 1% uh, in our case uh, of the 
carcasses that um, floated off to sea actually made landfall in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, I don't believe there's been any carcass drift studies down here that would give us some indication of what, when something does wash up on the beach, what percentage is it of the whole. Um, but anyway, we know that um, offshore there was a, an attempt um, by BP and the government to keep the animals from coming onshore in great numbers. And the excuse was, this is a health problem. We don't want to create a health hazard. Um, and in, I, that will only be a good excuse if they kept tallies of all the numbers that died, because all the numbers, all the animals are evidence for, for federal court. We, the people, own these animals, um, and they become evidence for damages to charge for BP. In Exxon Valdez, the carcasses were kept under triple lock and key security until the Natural Resource Damage Assessment Study was completed. And that was in about a year and a half, two and a half years after um, the spill. And then all the animals were burned, but not until then. That was Ricky Ott. Um, uh, she's an Exxon Valdez survivor. Uh, she's a marine biologist. Jerry Cope, take it from there and what happened, do you believe, to the animals in the Gulf, to the marine life? Well, the, there were two dramatic sequences that were described by uh, workers that were out at the source, which is what they called the Canyon 252 site where this incident occurred. And uh, they reported seeing just, as far as I could see, uh, dead carcasses of all kinds of marine life out near the source. And then there was also, uh, we heard numerous accounts of a large wave of marine life being pushed into shore as the dispersant in the oil, the first wave, came in and approached towards the end of June. And then all of a sudden, it, it was simply gone. All of these... All of these animals disappeared. They didn't show up in the lagoons in any large numbers. And uh, it, everyone, all the scientists, were questioning, where did they go? I spoke to Hal Whitehead, who studied extensively sperm whales, specifically the ones down in the Gulf of Mexico. And there was an unusual pod that was resident in the area of the Mississippi Canyon site. And They've also disappeared, the entire pod, and that was an unusual social structure there in that those particular sperm whales were not terribly the nomadic. They seemed to stay there, as well as the usual whales that moved in and out with the population. What about the Corexit, Jerry Cope, uh, the chemical dispersant? What the government is saying, uh, there is just tremendous um, uh, elation in the media now, uh, with the government announcing that 75 percent of the oil is gone. What about the Corexit? Well, last week we, we spent two days flying over the Gulf. Uh, we went south from Louisiana and then all the way out, then back, all the way back up to Florida. And for as, as far as the eye can see, the entire Gulf of Mexico is a very strange green color. It's not blue at all. It's green, and it's iridescent. You can the dispersant obviously covers the entire ocean out there, well beyond the site of the spill, and there's nothing moving. We saw in two days of flying four dolphins that didn't appear to be very happy, and then three schools of rays, as I put in the article. It's uh, there's nothing moving out in the water there, and as far as the effects of the Corexin, uh, the EPA came out with these wonderful reports yesterday how it's no more toxic than the oil, but I didn't read in any of those reports just how toxic the oil was. Uh, BP and their training classes for hazmat, all the crews that worked on this spill, part of that training, which was a four-hour program, is they told them in no uncertain terms, if you had any cuts to your skin, abrasion, open wounds, and it was exposed to the crude oil in the water, on the beaches, any form whatsoever, you could pretty much guarantee yourself that you would get cancer in your lifetime. And that was part of the training class. So the oil is most definitely toxic. The Corexit 
is very toxic in my opinion. It's terrible. It evaporates and put all the puts all of this up into the atmosphere. There's a lot of sick people ar along the coast.